Okay, so we're talking about uh, Simone de Beauvoir. Simone de Beauvoir is uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's lifelong companion. Okay, as I mentioned last class, they are buried next to each other in uh, Cimetière Pierre Lachaise uh, in, in, in Paris. And uh, there is a, a great deal of similarity with uh, their philosophies. This idea of um, responsibility, this uh, idea of freedom, this, this idea of uh, shaping one's own identity. So that's what we're talking about with Jean-Paul Sartre, okay? And this is the main quote that I want you to retain here. Let me just jump ahead. Is with Jean Paul Sartre, we're talking with Simone de Beauvoir. I guess one of the main concepts that we're talking about is is identity. Okay. Um, how how do we label ourselves, and how are we limited by those labels? Okay. Remember, we said with Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard says, once you label me, you negate me. Once you encapsulate me and you you conceptualize me. You, you lose me as an individual, okay? You are simply dealing with me as a kind of a, as a generalized idea, a construct, okay? Uh, so we have to talk about identity, identity categories. Um, and we have to talk about basically how these identity, how these identity categories are, insofar as they are concepts, how they are either constructed and to what degree they actually have a bearing in reality, okay? So remember when we talked about um, uh, Nietzsche and we we're talking about concepts, we said concepts are kind of, you know, man-made ideas. They only exist in our head. And part of the, uh, the labels that we use to identify ourselves, our identity labels, and the labels that we use to sort of catalog and group people together, they are concepts. So insofar as they are concepts, we have to ask the further question, uh, are they rooted in some reality or are they rooted in a kind of uh, make-believe games that we play that then take on momentum and they take on a life of their own? Let me, let me just make this point, okay? And then I want to spend quite a bit of time analyzing uh, this famous quote from Simone de Beauvoir, which I want you to retain, okay? I'm going to analyze it in about two, two or three different ways. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples. I'm going to be on this slide for quite some time. Um, but let me just make this point. There, let me make two points going in. Okay. There's, there's, a lot, there's a lot in my head, and it's gradually going to come out. The first one I want to make is this. Is, as I said, we make, a big, we make quite a big deal about all of our uh, identity labels. Okay. Um, and the, my first point is this, if aliens were to come down on earth, I'm not entirely sure that they would group us the way that we, we, we group and we catalog ourselves, okay? Uh, man, woman, black, white, rich, poor, young, old, you know, um, fat, skinny, all of these dividing categories that we can go on uh, for a very, very long time with all of these dividing categories. I'm not sure aliens, would divide us up the way that we divide up ourselves. So what, what does that signify? Let's sort of unpack that idea a little bit. The first thing it signifies, the first way of understanding that is to say, well, what do you mean? Okay, how can our divisions uh, be mistaken? Okay, because you say, I see them. I see race, I see gender. Therefore, how can you tell me that uh, these dividing lines that we group people in, that they, they are not real when they are just obvious. So one perspective is to say that the way that we group people is somehow uh, has some kind of empirical legitimate basis uh, that we are not in, we are in some sense, we, we are not hypnotized by our language, that our language is a veritable expression of real groups that exist. Okay, that's one possibility. The other possibility, which is in line with what I said about, you know, aliens maybe dividing us up differently than we divide up ourselves. The other possibility is that um, these categories, these, these categorical conceptions that we have, maybe new, they do not exist in the real world as much as we believe that they actually do. And that therefore, as Nietzsche said, we are in some sense victims of our own linguistic framework, okay? Um, and the tragedy is, and this is also the tragedy, is we make them real. We make our concepts 
And alongside our categorical concepts, our groupings, what those, th those are not just sort of neutral groupings. Those groupings also carry, carry with them uh, prejudices, disparities, discriminations, false assumptions, uh, hasty generalizations. So these groupings are also dangerous uh, to some degree. Okay, they, they cause injustices uh, it, it completely illegitimately. Okay, they, they, they box people in, they limit people and so on. So we need to unpack that. Let me, now let me just say this because she's gonna be specifically interested in the question of gender and the question of what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to, what is this feminine identity? And there's two, there's, we need to make a distinction in relation to what I've been saying thus far. We can say that what is the relationship between the sex of a person and the uh, gender of a person? Now, initially, you might say, well, what, what, is there a difference between sex and gender? Okay. And now that's something that I've also personally had to sort of get past, that those things are so deeply equated that again, it's very difficult to, 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 to see beyond. Maybe you guys are a little bit better than I am, okay? Maybe you guys are exposed to this kind of language, uh, you know, through, through your exposure, through your friends, through education in a way that I was not, okay? So when I first came across this quote, one is not born a woman, but becomes a woman. I said, well, what, what, is that? what does that mean? How, how can that be? So what kind of feminist propaganda is this, okay? But when you start to understand the argument, it's, it's quite simple, okay? And it's, it's quite clear and it's quite obvious. This is the point, but let me try to articulate it this way. There are things that we attribute to what it means to be a man and to what it means to be a woman that we attribute to biology and anatomy. Some of those things, those things are true. In other words, men are statistically larger, physiologically speaking, than women, okay? That's an empirically verifiable thing. And so there are some ideas that we have about men that are related to biology and women that are related to biology. And there are some ideas that we believe, now this is the important part. There are some ideas that we believe are a natural consequence of being born a female or a natural consequence of being born a male, but they are not. Once you actually look at it empirically and scientifically, what you start to realize is this is not rooted in nature. This is not an automatic consequence of being born with a given genitalia, uh, uh, being born of a, of, a, of a specific sex. This is societal conditioning. This is prevailing ideologies and assumptions that then take on a life of their own and they end up becoming real, okay? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot that I wanna unpack. Again, if you, if you have any questions, comments, reactions, or criticisms, just, uh, just jump right in and cut me off. Um, let me give you a kind of, um, no, let me make this point first. Let me sort of articulate what I just said in a slightly different way. And this is a kind of an idea that comes from uh, stoicism, this kind of uh, philosophy from antiquity. And it's also sort of echoed with Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. So this is the idea. So it's almost, it's almost worth noting. This idea that there are two types of mistakes that you can make. The first type of mistake that you can make is you can try to change something that can't be changed, okay? In other words, you have not correctly assessed the reality of the situation. You think that you can change something, you're trying to change something that you can't change, okay? That you do not have power over. Um, so that would be sort of futility. You're banging your head against the wall, it's not gonna change the situation. That's the first type of error that you can make. The second type of error that you can make is the inverse of the first one, which would be what? The second error is you believe you cannot change something that you actually can change. In other words, you assume that you have no involvement and consequently no responsibility and authority over something that is actually in fact dependent on you, okay? So how does that relate to this? How does that relate to identity categories? Is we very often think we make, what Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir are gonna say is what mistake do we typically make? We make the second mistake. We usually don't make the first mistake. 
okay? Uh, we convince ourselves that something is just so and is just naturally so and therefore must be so when actually it isn't, okay? Um, so let me start off with a kind of a, an a kind of a simple example. And then I'll give you some personal exa examples, okay? Things that I've come across with, uh, with my daughter. But let me start with this and then I wanna start to unpack this quote slowly. There's about two or three ways that I need to unpack that quote. Okay. So maybe some of you are looking at this quote and you maybe you had the, the reaction to this quote that I initially had when I first saw this quote, which is how, how does this make sense? Okay, but it makes perfect sense. So let's go. So let, let's consider this. Uh, is Let me start with the example. Is there are more women in nursing and there are more women uh, than the, and there are more men in engineering. So you might be tempted to say that uh, that you know career orientation, is a, is a natural byproduct of something natural about men and women. Again, that might be partially true, but also part of it might be these, these ideas that we sort of bring about for ourselves. There are differences between men and women, and some of those differences do have a, a biological basis. But again, the mistake that we make is we attribute things to biology that have no basis in biology, okay? Um, so the idea that uh, statistically speaking, it is true that there are less women in the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So if you're approaching it simplistically, you say, look, there are less women in engineering. Therefore, women are either, um, either inherently disinterested in the subject or they're not as good at the subject. Okay, but that's that's kind of a little bit mistaken, because if you put very young children in a room with toys, the they, they don't know what are boy toys and what are girl toys. That is also something that is taught. And again, that's the camel stage. The conditioning happens at a very early age, and I'll give you some specific examples with my daughters. The point is, young children, uh, boys and girls, the boys will play with the dolls just as often as the girls will play with the, the Legos. Um, but now put those same children in that same room a year and a half later, and gradually they start to orient themselves towards uh, the toys that you think are, let's say, gender appropriate, if that has any meaning. Uh, so the point of the matter is, there's kind of a conditioning that happens at a very early age. And even, let's say, when you test uh, cross exam, you know, you do, you do a cross comparison of math scores between uh, girls and boys at the college level, boys score higher. And then you just conclude, you might conclude then something like this, okay? That boys are just better at math, okay? So you take a statistical fact. Now, first of all, you have to assume that, that those statistics were accumulated correctly. Let's assume that they were, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. You, you, you encounter some statistical distribution. Men get higher math scores than girls. Uh, that, that, than women. Uh, then you derive from that some sort of implicit, implicit assumption. The assumption is, so men are, as we have been told, and this is uh, therefore further proof of it, men are more logical and analytical. And then we have the opposite characteristics applied to women, which is women are more sort of emotional and uh, compassionate and all this stuff. And so then, and then you conclude a sort of a policy or an ethics based on that, which is therefore, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a girl, don't bother with math, okay? And so you know, if that is based on a false understanding of what gave rise to, this, to the statistics, you are limiting somebody. Um, that the, the point is we make it, we make these things true. Um, if you think that boys are tougher than girls and girls are, you know, more, more, they play more softly than boys and you treat them accordingly, then what you end up finding is that you have conditioned a boy to be, to play, you know, more rough and you've conditioned your young girl to be more calm and docile. Uh, and then you, we, this kind of, our, our, it's kind of a reverse causal argument. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You create the conditions by which you make your idea true. You create the conditions by which you make your unconscious idea true. And then you take that as evidence for your basic assumption. 
So let me give you another, now, if you talk about, let's say race, uh, let me give you some examples, for instance. Um, or let me give you, let's say one more example with words, gender. So let's say a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, there were basically no women in education. You know, 150 years ago, there were no women in education. It was regarded as kind of a waste of time. And then once they are uneducated, you say, oh, well, women don't understand things. You see, they're stupid. And then once they are uneducated and they are stupid, you then say, don't waste your time because they're stupid. So it's a kind of, you know, it's kind of the chicken or the egg and you get it all backwards. We get our wires crossed. We assume that things have a biological basis when they're actually socially propagated myths that take on a life of their own. So let me, let's talk about, let's say race is uh, two examples, okay? Let's say specifically in the United States because the United States is obsessed with race. Uh, there, it's true statistically that there are more black people in prison, okay, with criminal records. So if you are simplistic in your analysis, you say something like, there are more black people in prison, therefore, um, black people are more predisposed to criminality, okay? You, you, you draw that false assumption, and then you say, you know, therefore, if I meet any black individual, I'm going to, I'm going to have that basic assumption, that, that, that basic reaction, which is, which, is, which is based on a fallacy. It's based on uh, a, a poor understanding of the situation, okay? Or you say, uh, black people are financially poorer in the United States. And then you say, but the United States is the land of the free and the home of the brave. Anybody who works hard enough can, can surely you know, work themselves out of any situation. Anybody who works really hard can be rich. You, know, you have this kind of fantasy. And then, therefore, you blame them. You, you created the circumstances by which systemically they are, um, less opportunities are given to them. And it becomes a vicious, it becomes, it's, you, that's the wording she uses later on. She says it is a vicious circle, okay? It becomes a vicious downward spiral. Uh, and then you say, oh, well, if they are poor, that's because it's their choice. They're, they don't care or they're not motivated or whatever. And you come up with a, now this, this is the tragic point is, as I said, we make these things real. So even if you say, even if you don't identify as a black person, the police over that, the, the police officer that's pulling you over is, um, why do we do that? You know what I mean? We, we have, a kind, maybe it's a kind of a mechanism in our brain. That, 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 that tendency to generalize. You see the, you know, you're a police officer, you, you, you pull over this black person. And even though this person does not even identify as being black, you are projecting onto them this idea of blackness and all of the preconceptions that go along in your head with them. And some of them can be uh, Ill, ill-informed and some of them can be vicious um, judgments and generalizations, okay? So you see, you see where it goes. Um, so let's unpack this a little bit further. Um, what do I want? To, let's let's get into this quote here. So one is not born a woman; one becomes a woman. Uh, we need to make a distinction. Let me go back a few slides here. He's not cooperating with me now. We need to make a distinction, and it should be a pretty clear distinction that um, we can make a distinction. And now, again, initially, I said, well, what, what is distinction? What is this? this what, is this really a meaningful thing? You can talk about the biology of a person, the sex, okay? You are born male or you are born female. And uh, again, for the most part, you are born male and you are conditioned into this idea of what a man is. Uh, you are born female and you are conditioned into what this idea of a woman is. But the point is, gender is a societal construct. It's an idea, it's a role. Some of that might be based in biology, but a lot of it is not. And for the simple fact that if you look throughout history, our ideas about man, what makes a man and what makes a woman are different from one place from, to, to a different time, to a different culture. Um, so in other words, it is not that these features are a natural consequence of your biology. Now, furthermore, and this is something that we also have to consider, is that there are also some people that do not even fit into this mold. Uh, they're, they're not born with a genitalia that is a clearly you know, a penis or a vagina. You have intersex people. It's not if you have a kind of amb ambigu ambiguous genitalia. 
And now that itself, in and of itself, causes problems for some worldview, okay? So that's kind of one way of understanding it, is that the kind of the camel way of understanding it, is you are, from a very early age, conditioned. You are um, nudged this way or that way into this idea of, uh, you know, masculine and feminine. Uh, so that would be, let's say, the negative idea. You are not born. You are born a female, uh, but you become a woman. Society makes you into a woman based on its own ideology, the prevailing ideology of what a woman is. You are shaped into it in the kind of the camel stage that we talk about with Nietzsche. You can also say one is not born a man. One becomes a man. Okay. You, uh, one is one. You, 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 you can uh, you're born a male and you become a man. Typically, there's that sort of the correlation. Okay. Um, let me give you, like, actually, let me, let me spend a little bit of time on that. Okay. I have uh, these balloons in, in the background. I think somebody's coming up in the chat. Hopefully the chat doesn't stall on me. Um, is this why there's toxic masculinity because of these assumptions? This is what you call sort of the, the patriarchy. And that's specifically what she's going to say is, um, specifically these ideas that, uh, are prevailing in a given culture about what a, what a man is and what a man ought to be and what a woman is and what a woman ought to be. And those things, she's going to say, some of those things are uh, outdated. Some of those ideas are pointless. And some of those ideas, again, are not rooted in empirical fact. Um, that you can have a, a, a woman engineer. And for, oh my God, some people cannot understand. You can have a woman engineer and you can have a male nurse and the male nurse is just as competent uh, in his field as uh, the woman engineer is in her field. And um, it, it's negative, okay? She's gonna say specifically, she's interested in analyzing the label, the identity label of what it means to be a woman, because she says, look, this, this, um, this label has been, let me back up here just to make the point. This, this label has been constructed and has been passed on and uh, you know, intensified culturally and historically throughout centuries and even millennia. And we need to understand what is the basis of this idea of what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man, and specifically what it means to be a woman, because it defines what is expected, what is allowed, what is valued in us, and it defines you know generalization and discrimination. And it it, it closes what the point is. She's going to talk about freedom afterwards. Is it closes doors? And it closes potential that don't need to be closed. Uh, you are you end up being limited, but not because of things that are out of your control. You end up limited because of bad ideas. And yes, it affects women, and it also affects men. Okay, as a, as another student mentioned in the other class, you know the 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 idea of what a, a, a masculinity is a, a kind of a game that is 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 like kind of point is like you know soldiers have to go to war and they die but no that's what they have to do you know and they or they come back with ptsd so it's not even advantageous to men in many cases we have to sort of simon de Beauvoir is going to say we need to take responsibility of these of these uh, identities we need to realize that we are they are a product of us these identity labels are a product of us we are not a product of them, okay? Um, so let me just talk about these balloons in the background for a second, okay? We, we had this um, baby shower over Zoom for my sister-in-law over the course of the weekend, last Saturday. And I, I, I made the joke. I said, okay, you know, part of what we're gonna be doing here is gonna be doing this gender reveal. It's not really a gender reveal. What it is is let's talk about uh, the genitals of an unborn fetus because it's very, very important. And in some sense, we, we are right in making it important because we end up making it such a big deal, okay? Uh, that, oh no, I need to know what your child is. I need to know what is between your child's legs before it's even born because I have to go shopping. And God forbid I buy blue for a girl or pink for a boy, I can't have that, okay? Uh, that itself is completely arbitrary, okay? If, if that does not capture the arbitrariness of our ideas about sexual identity and gender identity, this idea that boys are blue and girls are pink, uh, there are many students that have pointed out to me that at the beginning of the 20th century, it was actually the opposite, 
boys were pink and girls were blue. And then it got switched around just to show you how arbitrary it is. Asking, is there, in other words, is there something naturally biological that indicates what color a gender should be? The question, what is the color of a gender is almost like asking, what is the financial status of a banana? It's a, it's a meaningless question. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything, okay? It's just, you're just playing with words. Um, let me see if I wanna go into some more, like, let's say, okay. So, and the point is this conditioning happens to you whether you're uh, a boy or a girl, you are conditioned, you are nudged subtly and even sometimes aggressively one way or the other. No, you can't do that. No, you know, don't play with dolls. You know, uh, there are some parents that get, you know, I've seen footage of some parents go into their day, their child's daycare and they're screaming at the educators because I heard that you allowed my son to wear a dress. You know, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're trying to turn my son into a homosexual as though that's how it works. As though that's how it works, okay? So it's, it's bad, it's bad, okay? The, the confusion runs deep. Uh, there are some cultures where men wear, they, they wear basically dresses, you know? In Scotland, they, the men wear kilts. Am I gonna question the virility, their virility? Am I gonna question their masculinity? I don't think it's in my best interest to, you know, uh, to do that. I'm probably gonna get my ass kicked, okay? Um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of strange, you know what I mean? So this is the point, story with my daughter is even before you know that you're a boy or even before you know that you're a girl, to be more specific, even before you even know that there's a distinction between male and female, okay, because you're not a boy or a girl, you are made into a, a boy or a girl. Uh, even before you, you know that there are uh, different types of genitalias and you are associated with one and there's this whole package that comes with the genitalia is, uh, and that we need to unpack a little bit further as well. Even, let me make the point, even before my girls knew that they were girls, they, the conditioning had already started. You probably figure out that, you know, I think my daughter figured out that she was a girl when she's about two, two and a half years old. And in those two and a half years, there's a lot of subtle, unconscious, even conscious conditioning on the part of parents, grandparents, society, interactions with other friends, okay? And then your children start to, to, start to watch TV. They start to encounter uh, advertisement targeted to children. Okay. They go to school. This is not, so this is a funny story. My daughter was upstairs. She was, she's uh, my youngest daughter is three years old. She just turned three. Okay. And she was, uh, she was peeing in the bathroom and my wife was there overseeing it. And in so much as a, a three-year-old can articulate, this is what she said. She says, mommy, I want to pee standing up because Idris had gathered, he, he pees standing up. Um, and I started dying of laughter, you know what I mean? Because she doesn't even know that there's this distinction to be made. Uh, and yet there's a lot of conditioning going on. So one, one simple example, and then I'll give you some better examples, is uh, my wife is sort of aware of this. So let me tell you two stories. One story is she said, well, I'm just going to brainwash the kids. She says, I'm going to brainwash the kids today. And I'm going to make our oldest daughter, I'm going to convince her that she loves dinosaurs. And after a few hours, my oldest daughter, who at the time was about three years old, was saying, oh, I love dinosaurs. Yeah, oh, T-Rex, is not that? Okay. So, and she says it as, as though it's completely her own choice. It's her own preference. She really says it out of a conviction that uh, she had the idea for herself. And now, because the, the indoctrination and the brainwashing is, is effective, my, now my youngest daughter also likes dinosaurs. We didn't have to do the same pattern with her. She is just modeling herself after her older sister. So it just, you see how we kind of, the, the, the modeling and the shaping of identity is kind of self-propagating. We're all kind of caught up in it. And the joke is, as Nietzsche would say, the joke is on us because it's partly our own invention and we, we succumb to our own invention. Uh, another example was, you know, my father-in-law bought a blue blanket with space rockets on, uh, for, for our nephew. And he bought these pink blankets with uh, mermaids on it for my daughters. And my wife said, what, what is this shit? Take it back. We want blue space blankets. And my daughters love the blue space blankets. Okay. So it kind of arbitrary stuff. Let me, let me see if I have another example there. Um, so in what way can we interpret this sort of positively? And then I want, I want to say one more thing. Is one way you can interpret this is one is not born a woman, but becomes a woman. 
uh, assuming that you are born female, you become a woman, is to say, in other words, you, you take responsibility for it. You realize that this thing is not set in stone. This identity is not set in stone. And you are going to partake in creating in, and redefining what it means to be a woman as someone living in Canada at the beginning of the 21st century, okay? So let me give you a specific example. This is the example I wanted to, I was gonna use this example a little bit later, but let me use it now. Is, um, what, I forget her name now. There's one, one uh, lady whose name is, uh, I believe her name is, uh, it just eluded me. There are some, some cases, you know, in the 50s and 60s where women were not allowed to run marathons. Now I'll give you some more subtle examples, but this is the, this is the best example. Uh, women were not allowed to run marathons. Okay, because the men decided, no, women running marathons, no, that's ridiculous. Come on, we know it's in their best interest. We, we, women are going to get hurt. It's going to be embarrassing. They're going to embarrass themselves if they run a marathon. So no, 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 women are not allowed to run a marathon because we know what's in their best interest. So we had some sort of pioneer uh, women runners in the you know, 40s and 50s and 60s uh, that the marathon would only be run by men. And there was a case in Boston, this particular uh, woman whose name now I forget. There was another case in, um, uh, in France, I believe. Uh, this woman says, well, in other words, you can, you can, you can buy the marketing. You, you can buy the marketing and you can, you can conclude, no, I'm a woman, therefore I don't run the marathon. Okay. But she says, well, you know, I think I want to run the marathon. And there, I don't really see any particular reason why I should run the marathon. So she's standing at the beginning of the race watching the race start, and then she starts to run. She takes off her sweater, she has a t-shirt underneath, and she's running the race, and the organizers of the race start to run, run after her, trying to tackle her down, okay, and she gets away from them, and she runs the race, okay? The organizers were freaking out, oh my, what, a, what an atrocity, what an abomination of nature. We can't allow this. This woman is destroying the sanctity and uh, the sacredness of this male ritual. It's bullshit, okay? So that's what Simone de Beauvoir is going to say. That is redefining and taking ownership of that identity label okay uh, prior to this woman a woman was defined as someone who cannot possibly physiologically run a, mar a marathon and after it you have to say yes women are also capable of running marathons and they should be able to run marathons there's no reason why they should be restricted or preventing from running marathons okay so let, let me try to articulate the point this is the tragedy the tragedy is that a child may have a capacity, let's say a young girl, might have a, uh, the capacity to run a marathon, but the idea is stripped away from her even before she can even fantasize about running a marathon. That's, there's, a, there's an element of tragedy there. Uh, because why? Because the child is limited without even knowing that they are limited. Arbitrarily so, arbitrarily so. Uh, even more of a tragedy is, you know, I might, you might have, let's say, a young daughter that is watching a movie or something like that and gets the idea, hmm, maybe I want to run a marathon. It's, it seems like a, a cool thing to do. And in the future, when I grow up, I want to run a marathon. And then gradually, either directly or indirectly or subtly over time, that idea is knocked out of her head. It's erased, okay? And the child who had a, a, a sort of a dream of, yeah, that would be cool one day to run a marathon. That, I, that idea is stripped out of, out of her head. So you are then arbitrarily limited by the identity label uh, that is sort of uh, having a bearing on you, all right? Let me give you one more, talking about kind of sports here. Uh, let me go off on that a little bit. Um, we live in front of a soccer field. We live in front of a park and there's a soccer field right in front of my house. And right down the park, there are tennis courts. And there was an older relative uh, of my wife's that came over one day and we were looking at the soccer field. And this is what he said. He said, oh yeah, tennis is a good sport for girls. You know, and I found it funny because I'm like, well, why not the soccer field? So there was an implicit idea in what he was saying. The implicit idea in what he was saying is soccer is not for girls. Don't waste your time, okay? So let's kind of unpack that a little bit. Uh, there is... You know, somebody came, somebody asked the question in the other class, should uh, women professional basketball players be paid as much as male professional basketball players? And the answer is a little bit complicated, okay? The answer is, 
Ideally, ultimately, down the line, yes. But right for, for the moment, no, it's, it's not going to happen because there's a whole system of a marketing and sponsorship and ticket sales and popularity. There's a whole culture built around the NBA, which is not built around the WNBA. Okay. So even if you wanted to, you couldn't, you couldn't even pay women as much as uh, men because the system is not there. What the NBA should be doing is they should be promoting and uh, funding the, the, the women's game. And what you would hope to see is that you, know, you have to understand that, let's say, sports like soccer, sports like basketball, men have had a 100-year advantage. There's been a lot of uh, you know, training and refining and encouragement and so on. And uh, you know, investment into sort of institutions and in infrastructure that you would hope that given enough time, uh, the, the, the women's league will be comparable to and as popular as, let's say, the NBA. And the athletes would hopefully be paid as much, as much, and they will generate as much revenue, and they'll sell as many tickets, and they'll have the same amount of merchandise and so on. And then you can go on, you can say, well, should they play then on the same team? I don't, I look, I'm not even sure that that's necessary to do. It might be the case, okay? We say, well, what if they play football? Women should play football. They shouldn't be prevented from playing football in the same way that, you know, 150 years ago, they were, pre they were prevented from going to school, and there was no basis for it. Uh, women should play football. Should women play football alongside men? Again, I don't think that's that, that's not necessarily the point. And there are physiological differences. You know, uh, you might want to make uh, the the argument sort of uh, that there are sort of dangers that there are uh, men are larger in stature and physical physically proportionally. Um, but now, if you look, let's say, like at, at a sports uh, a sports like tennis, where that that idea hasn't, uh, that sort of um, the sexist limitations were not historically in that sport for whatever reason, because arbitrarily it was understood that, uh, yeah, ten tennis women can play tennis. I would assume and I would hope that, I, for, like the, 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 the skill of top female tennis players is comparable in my opinion, to, to the skill and the performance of, of, of male uh, professional tennis players. And I would hope and I would assume that say someone like Serena Williams makes as much money as Novak Djokovic, okay? Um, so this idea, you know, uh, no, you know don't, don't, don't put your girls in hockey, don't put your girls in uh, soccer, don't put your girls in uh, basketball because you're wasting your time. But the point is you end up making it true. Because there are less people willing to do that, uh, there's going to be uh, less involvement, less popularity, and the slow the, the sport is the, the sport is going to be slower to develop. And the, the the person is right, not because he's inherently right, but because his ideas also alter uh, the, the 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 conditions. If that makes sense, okay. Um, let me let me go in a slightly different direction with regards to let's say race, okay. Um, we make a big deal about, about race, and rightly so, but we, 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 we love to now reinforce those, those group divisions. And I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong here, but this idea that reinforcing the group divisions is somehow going to be beneficial towards anti-racism. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong and I haven't understood it, but I find it strange that anti-racism um, insists on you using the, 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 the labels of race. Um, you know, and it, it, it's like, let me, let me try to make the point. Again, I'm not sure that if aliens were to come down, they would group us the way that we group ourselves. That is to say, uh, I've met enough diversity that I've met some people of some ethnicities look like people from other ethnicities. I've met some people from other ethnicities look like, so... Um, my point is this, my point is, I know black people that are more white, not only in appearance, but also what you would say, if you want to call it culturally, than some white people. I know some white people that are more black than some black people that I know culturally and in terms of skin tone. Uh, and so I would almost, I would prefer to get rid of those labels altogether, but maybe, hold on, let me just hear me out here. 
there, there's, let, me, let me make two points. First point I want to make is uh, a quote that uh, I heard from a, a, an American sociologist or social critic. I forget his name and I regret it. Um, but he basically said something like this. And I'm, I'm in complete agreement. Okay, Maybe I might be wrong. If you want to challenge it, you can challenge it. But he says, racism is not a product of race. It's the other way around. Race is a byproduct of racism. In other words, you start with racism and you end up creating race and you end up reinforcing those, those lines. Okay. Um, let me give you one more example. This is a, one that came across. I was watching a show not long ago called uh, American Gods. And in the second uh, episode, the opening scene is a bunch of African men shackled in the hall, in the dark hull of a boat. And they're being basically shipped across the Atlantic. Uh, to be sold as commodities, to be sold into the slave trade, okay? And you have uh, one of these men is shackled and he starts to sort of pray to um, a spider, okay? Like a God that he's identifying with the spider. And he says, you know your way, basically he's, um, it's, it's a very long and interesting scene, but he said, basically says, you know your way out of sticky situations and my hands are tied, so I cannot offer you anything, but, but please help me get out of the situation. And this God that he's praying to becomes present. He becomes uh, personified as a person standing in front of him. And he, he kind of, this God looks like a very sort of flamboyant, like 1950s, 1960s, like Taylor from Harlem. Okay. And he says, he says, brother, you don't even know what you're in for. Okay. Let me tell you the history of the black man in America, that you're basically looking towards five, 300 years of subjugation that you're gonna be a slave and um, all of these basically going on listing all the abuses and there's gonna be Jim Crow and so on. He says, brother, you don't even know what you're in for, okay? This is the history of the black man in America. This is where you're heading. And he looks at the, this man who's kind of chained and he says, oh, he says, oh, you don't know that you're black yet. Let me tell you something, you're black because he's gonna call you black because he's gonna call himself white, okay? You don't even know that you're black yet, okay? So that's, I found that interesting. So the point is, let me make a few points here. The point is, if you go back 400, 500 years in Africa, Africans did not go around calling themselves black. Now there is something to be said about reappropriating uh, and taking ownership for yourself of, of certain terms. You know, like the, the term is, uh, is you are utilizing the term which was given to you by the, the oppressor, but there's something to be said about re reappropriating the term, okay? Uh, but again, I find it funny that um, an anti-racism reinforces the, the, the dividing lines that are in some sense arbitrary. And I'm going to make that point as well. Let me see what time I got here. Okay. This is the point. Okay. This is the let's talk facts. Okay. If you want to open up your eyes and you really want to start to understand things, the fact of the matter is we're all African. Okay. We're all African. We all come from Africa. And then we came out of Africa and we started getting excited and we started playing the game of tribalism and we are different from them and, and so on. And, and you get into a bunch of trouble. Let me, let me go even further here. So I said, one way of understanding this is in the kind of the negative way that you are indoctrinated into the prevailing idea of what it means to be a woman. It, it, it does not come like a zip file that is already in your brain uh, that, you know, it, it's not in your brain when you're in the womb of your mother, that you're gonna be wearing dresses and putting on makeup, okay? That is something that you're taught, okay? That's the negative formulation. The positive formulation is, I'm going to become a woman, I'm going to, I'm going to own the label, and I'm going to take, take charge of it. I'm going to redefine it in a way that's meaningful and beneficial for me. I'm going to own it. I'm going to define myself as a woman in, in terms that are meaningful for me. But let's go even further, okay? Um, Let's consider, let's say, three different worldviews. If you come from a very religious worldview, the idea that there's a difference between being a female and being a woman is just incomprehensible. It doesn't even enter into your language. You know, it's like, what do you mean that being a woman and being a female are not necessarily equal to each other? Okay. As was pointed out by a student in another class. You know, from a transgender perspective, 
you can be a woman without having been born a female. And there's there's truth to that because uh, being a woman is 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 um, is 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 a kind of a performance. It's something that people identify you as. You identify people as being a woman. You don't need, let's say, a chromosomal test, or you don't need to verify what genitalia they have between their legs for you to interact with them and acknowledge them as women. Okay. So say like you have a crossdresser. A crossdresser is going to present themselves as a woman to you. And you're going to just conclude that there's, there is standing a woman. You know what I mean? So, so now let me go even a little bit further. There are some, we're talking about, because you see, what I'm, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is it's, it's, it's a word. And it's going to depend on how you define the word. There are some feminists, this is a, min a minority of feminists, that disapprove of transgender, trans women identifying themselves as simply women, okay? Because some of the, this minority of feminists say that undermines what it means to be a woman, okay? It undermines, let's say, the struggle of what it means to be a woman. It undermines what it means to be a mother and to give birth and so on. So the, 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 the feminists, some, some of them, want to hold on to um, what it means to be a woman and say, being a woman is being a female, okay? Now, how does the, you know, the LGBTQ community define what it means to be a woman? For them, they say it's not necessary to be female to be a woman. And that's their definition of what it means to be a woman. So every group has their own definition of what it means to be a woman. And there's not going to be any agreement because your, your, your epistemology is different. In the same way that we said that you know, uh, a religious person and an evolutionary biologist are never going to agree on the story of creation because they're, 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 it, it's a matter of how are you defining the term? Okay. And then you call each other names. Okay. You call, uh, you're, you're, you're a leftist extremist or you're, you're, uh, you're, you're a religious extremist or you're a transphobic. And we, and you know, you don't agree with my definition of the word, but I want to use the word. So let's, let's now create more tribalism. Very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Again, if you have any criticisms, uh, just jump right in. Um, what else did I want to say? Let me see here. Okay, let's let's start to unpack the quotes. Um, so again, we she's specifically interested in understanding what ideology and what worldview, historical factors, cultural factors, religious factors have shaped this idea, this 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 woman, the, this label of what it means to be a woman, and how can we uh, unpack it? How can we unpack it and rearrange it in a way that's more adequate? more truthful, more empirical, more meaningful, okay? Uh, also the idea that, you know, even being born with a specific genitalia, being born male or female, in some cultures, that's all that it is. You're either born male or female, and you don't admit, you know, what you would call intersex people, people that are born with, that it's not quite clear whether they, they, they differ in terms of their actual physiological makeup or whether they differ in terms of their sexual orientation, that doesn't cause a problem for some worldviews, let's say Aboriginal spirituality. Uh, it does cause a problem for many monotheistic worldviews, specifically because of the idea of there's Adam and there's Eve. And that's a story that we're gonna unpack a little bit. So let's get into the, let's get into some of these, uh, the points here. Let me see, what time do we have? Uh, 11, okay, we're doing good. So I want you to understand this quote. That's one thing for the sake of test for studying. I want you to understand this quote as we unpacked it. Uh, I want you to understand now, what are some historical obstacles, not some historical factors that have shaped these, these identities, okay? And the last thing that I want you to understand is how is she going to define freedom, which is I think the best part, okay? So one thing is the sort of the archetype of what a woman is, which is unconsciously transferred over generationally, okay? From one generation to the next, this idea of what does it mean to be a woman? What is an archetype? An archetype is a kind of a, a prevailing, reoccurring identity. And with all the sort of characteristics that go along with that identity. So you can have the, the archetype of, you know, the masculine, the archetype of the feminine. You can have the archetype of, let's say, the wicked witch and the fairy godmother and, you know, the archetype of the hero and the soldier and the old wise man. And you can have the archetype of the mother and the father. And all these archetypes, okay? So the archetype of the, the woman, the eternal feminine that is sort of transferred over 
uh, and always has that kind of bearing. She says that is something that is kind of, it's there and it's, it, it's a self-propagating meme. It's a self-propagating idea that sort of take on, takes on a life of its own. The second one, and this one I do want to unpack a little bit more, is she says, uh, the feminists that want to make men an equal in every single respect, uh, she says, also sort of misses the point and also creates a kind of an obstacle because she said men and women are different. And some of those differences are, uh, you know, uh, genetic, hormonal, biological, but not to the degree that we attribute those differences. And furthermore, those, different, those differences should not justify why uh, women should get hired less or women should get paid less, even if there are, uh, you know, uh, some physiological differences. Um, now, this is kind of this came up in another class as well. Let me just take a few minutes to unpack it. This is more of a kind of an ethical question, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. Which is, should we necessarily insist that there should be an equal number of male nurses and an equal number of uh, female engineers? I think that we should move towards it, but I think that you know. It should automatically and always be 50-50. Maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating as well. Maybe, I'm, maybe that's kind of a straw man. Maybe nobody really says that. But th this is the point that I wanted to make because I found it interesting. Somebody in another class said, suppose you are, let's say, an engineering firm and you're hiring for 10 positions. And she says, let's say, hypothetically, you, um, you eliminate any indication of the person's gender in the hiring process, even in, let's say, the interview. You, uh, what's the word, you, you anonymize, you remove any a potential indication which will reveal to you whether you're dealing with a male or a female, a man or a woman. Um, now she says, you know, suppose you still, you do that and out of the 10 positions, you nonetheless hire 10 men. Is that intrinsically a problem? And I said, not, not, not really, no, it's not really a problem because what you should want is the, the total population, let's say of engineers, I would be satisfied in saying any, any young girl who entertains the idea of be being an engineer should be encouraged fully to be an engineer. She should consider that prospect and play with that idea until she either chooses to pursue it or abandon it for something else. I think that's the very least what, what we have to do. Okay. Uh, I think what that will ultimately amount to will be, and I don't think this should be forced. I think it would be a natural consequence that what you would get is the total population of engineers will gradually converge towards 50-50, okay? But now suppose in a given firm, 10 people just got hired through an anonymous hiring process, which eliminates their gender. And nonetheless, you hire 10 men. That's not in and of itself a problem, but some people are nonetheless gonna freak out and they shouldn't freak out because it just so happened to be 10 men, but it could have just, I mean, there's something to be said about representation. There's something to be said about role models for sure. But it just so happened to be 10 men, and it could have just so happened to have been 10 women. In other words, it's just a statistical anomaly. In other words, if I flip a fair coin 10 times, I may end up with 10 tails to zero heads or 10 heads to zero tails. That's just a, it's just a probabilistic distribution. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the coin. And there's not, it doesn't mean that there's something fundamentally skewed and unethical about the hiring practice. But again, I think we're, we're, we're nonetheless still far from even uh, saying, let's have a hiring practice which does not consider the gender of a person. Let's see what happens. We should just do it as almost as a social experiment, okay? Uh, if you guys have any thoughts or questions, just jump right in. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a little bit of time at the end of the lecture. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point here. This is another good one that I want you to retain. Is Aristotle, she's going to criticize Aristotle. She's going to say, look, some of these ideas go back millennia. They go back to uh, medieval philosophy. They go back to antiquity. And some of them go back to the book of, Gen you know, the book of Genesis and the Old Testament. So she's going to criticize one idea that comes from Aristotle, which is a very powerful idea. The idea of biological essentialism, which we've been touching upon. Okay. Do we attribute things to biology that aren't necessarily rooted in biology? Okay. So what, what is this idea of biological essentialism? that what you are biologically and anatomically is going to dictate your function, your behavior, your disposition, and so on. There's some truth to that, okay? For instance, Labrador dogs have webbed feet and Labrador dogs consequently have a natural disposition. They like to jump in water and swim, okay? 
They are biologically designed to do it. And therefore they have a sort of a, a disposition towards fulfilling that function. That explains actually a lot in the, in the, in the world of nature. But now let's, let's see how it applies to human beings. It applies to human beings in the sense that uh, we are biological organisms. And so behaviorally and psychologically, cognitively, we are also biologically determined to some degree. That's true. And but then furthermore, you go on to say there are biological differences between men and women. And therefore, those differences also manifest themselves in terms of behavioral differences and cognitive differences. OK, but the point is, then we, we in the history of Western philosophy and Western civilization, those differences have been augmented for men and belittled for women. So everything that I say here, she is quoting Aristotle, but criticizing Aristotle. OK, this is not Simone de Beauvoir that's saying it. This is Simone de Beauvoir paraphrasing and quoting Aristotle in order to make fun of it in a way. OK, so she says sort of uh, paraphrasing Aristotle's view of women, that women have ovaries. And therefore, according to Aristotle, she is imprisoned in her subjectivity. She is circumscribed within her own nature and she's limited by her own nature. It is often said that she thinks with her own glands. Okay. She thinks with her glands. You're too hysterical. You're too hormonal. Okay. That you're not seeing straight. Okay. You need to calm down. Um, that a man superbly ignores the fact that his anatomy also contains a gland, such as testicles, that also secrete hormones. He thinks, now this is the main quote here. It gets better and better in that it gets more scandalous. He thinks of his body as a direct and natural connection with the world, which he believes he apprehends objectively, whereas he regards the body of the woman as a hindrance, a prison, weighed down by everything particular to it. Okay. So this idea that, I was going to make a joke, let me forego the bad joke, but this idea that men see the world how it actually is, and women don't really have access to the world because they're a little bit too hormonal. So this idea that like even there, like, there have been social experiments, social psychology experiments that have been run like this, where let's say a, a, a female, a, a woman will say something in a meeting. You see, I even, my language, I get those things crossed. I, I want to say woman when I, I say female, when I want to say woman. They're, they're almost interchangeable for me, even though I know that they're not. Okay? The younger generation is able to make that, distinct, that distinction and, and not uh, interchange those words in a confused manner. But a, a, a woman can be in a meeting and she can present an idea. And then at the end of the meeting, when you ask the, the men in the meeting, who, who would you attribute, who would you give credit for this idea? They give, that, they give credit to another man because it's inconceivable that a woman would have said it. Okay. So the female is a female by virtue of lack of qualities, um, said Aristotle. We should regard the female nature as afflicted with a natural defectiveness, okay? That's pretty crazy. Um, and remember, Aristotle is one of the most important philosophers of Western civilization. And she, then she goes to, to talk about St. Thomas Aquinas, medieval philosopher, for his part pronounced woman to be an imperfect man, an incidental being. And then she goes on to talk about the book of Genesis. So now let me unpack the book of Genesis here. If, if this uh, interpretation offends you, then, because maybe you're, you're, if you're religious and this offends you, just say, uh, it, it is not the story that is itself sexist, but it is how it has been historically interpreted is not favorable to Eve, okay? So let's unpack that story two seconds. Uh, how, how does the creation of man take place? God, on the sixth day, Let's, let's forego the whole idea of Lilith, okay? This idea that Lilith was also made and Lilith was kind of rejected by God, okay? Uh, Lilith was another female that was made that was kind of rejected by God. Lilith was a bit of a rebel. In some cultures, they, they put more of an emphasis on Lilith. So maybe some people have never heard of Lilith. Let's, let, let, let's never mind Lilith. Let's talk about Adam and Eve, okay? Um, so, how is so sixth day God finally reaches the point where he's going to create man. He creates man in his own image. Okay. And he makes man out of clay. And now I'm talking about specifically man as in man as in Adam. He makes Adam out of clay and he breathes into the clay. And so Adam is both the material and now the uh, immaterial, immortal, transcendent soul, which is blown into Adam and Adam becomes alive. 
And Adam and God says, behold, my creation is complete. It's perfect. And God is happy. Okay. And that's it. That's it. Then God stops momentarily. And that the point is, uh, existence was supposed to be a bachelor party for all of eternity. Okay. And then God is about to turn away. And he just so happens to feel bad for Adam. He says, oh, Adam looks a bit lonely. In other words, he could have just as easily not felt bad for Adam. It just so happened to occur. Okay. And he says, okay, let me make Adam a companion. And there's also that idea of possessiveness. Eve is made for Adam. Okay. And now how is Eve made? Eve is made after Adam. So there's also a kind of hierarchy in the chronology, if you want to interpret it that way. And how does God make Adam? One way he could have made Adam is this. How does he make Eve? He could have made Adam and Eve simultaneously. He could have split the clay. And in splitting the clay, you have two mutually completing halves, man and woman, which kind of makes sense. You know, you breathe into it, you have Adam and Eve. How does it, who, which he makes Eve from Adam, correct? Which part of Adam does he use? Usually there's some people that know this story. Okay. Which part of, of Eve does he use? Which part of Adam does he use? Sorry. Okay. I'm more familiar with the story because we still had religious education when I was in high school. Is and it one of the ribs? The rib. The, okay. Yeah. He uses, I believe the right rib of Adam. Um, so he uses the rib of Adam. Now let's consider that. You know, you could have used the brain. The brain already has two hemispheres. You could have used the heart. The heart is symmetrical. At least use the liver. At least use the liver. The liver is a vital organ. At least use a vital organ. Okay. No, you use the spare rib. You use the spare rib of, 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 of Adam. And what Simone de Beauvoir is kind of laughing at is it's almost the most useless part of Adam. Okay. The only thing more useless in the human body would have been the tailbone. But you don't want to use the tailbone because then it's going to raise the question of why is there a tailbone? And then you get into the whole problem of evolution from apes and you don't want to deal with that problem if in the Bible. So you forgo the tailbone. So you use the rib, okay, which is the most useless part of Adam in order to make Eve. And the story doesn't finish there. Then a lot of interpretations uh, blame the fall of man, blame the fall of man on Eve, on the fallibility of Eve. She was the one that was tempted by Satan in the form of a serpent with the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so we are shunned and there is original sin and we are kicked out of uh, heaven and we are kicked out of the Garden of Eden and we are ashamed. And that is also, in many interpretations, blamed on Eve. Okay, let's proceed. It says, here is found the basic trait of a woman. She is the other in a totality of which the two components are necessary for one another. So she says, isn't it, isn't it funny that for the most part, a group that is marginalized and oppressed is usually the minority. Whereas here we have women, women are actually the majority and they end up getting the short end of the stick. So it's kind of like saying she is the other in a totality of which the two components are necessary to one another. It's like if I say I have a dollar, okay? But this side is worth 40 cents and this side is worth 60 cents. It, it, it doesn't really make sense, you know what I mean? Okay, so let's start, let's start. There's one more thing I wanna say and then I wanna to get to the point. Uh, she's quoting, she quotes George Bernard Shaw. Uh, speaking about, um, so let me just read it. The American white relegates the blank, the black to the rank of shoe shine boy, and concludes for this that the black is good for nothing but shining shoes. There is that vicious spiral that I'd said. You, 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 you create circumstances by which this group is marginalized, and once they are marginalized, you take their limitations as justification for why the, the, the machine can, should continue operating, okay? So, you know, uh, I gave you the example, you know, women are not educated, and so don't bother. They, it, you're gonna be wasting your money trying to educate your, your daughters. That was the idea, you know, 150 years ago. And now there are more female students than male students. We have, you know, the administration in Canada, now with Biden administration, the cabinet is 50-50. Okay, that's good. You know, in some Norway, in some Scandinavian countries, there are just as many women CEO, female CME, uh, women CEOs as there are male CEOs. And nonetheless, in some countries, if you are if you are a young woman fighting to be educated, you can get killed. Okay, so there's still a long way to go. You know, the the, the prevailing ideas, uh, man-made. Okay, man-made ideas. They're still there. They're still operating. There's still there's still work to be done. Got caught in our own trap of our own language and our own conceptions. So this is the real point. Okay, let's get to the, the, good, the good part. 
Um, now she's gonna talk about freedom. How are we supposed to understand freedom? Um, and I want you to keep in mind that idea of the, the, the marathon running. That is the true expression of freedom. She says, but aren't women happier being housewives? Aren't women happier being you know, stay-at-home mothers? And she says, basically, if I'm gonna be a housewife, I'm gonna decide for myself. I don't need some uh, authority um, sort of belittling me and telling me, we know what is already in your best interest. You, you're free, you're free of having to make a decision because the decision has already been made for you. It's been made in your best interest. She says, this notion we reject. We, this notion we reject um, for our perspective is that of an existential ethics. Now she's not talking about women anymore. She's talking about us as individuals, all of us as individuals having to take charge of our own identity. Okay, this is not just applicable to women, it's applicable to everybody. Um, this notion we reject for our perspective is that of an existential ethics. Every subject plays his part as such through specific exploits or projects that serve as a model of transcendence. Okay, uh, now this quote really captures it, this next line. He achieves, he achieves liberty, hold on. He achieves liberty only through a continual reaching out towards other liberties. That's very good, okay? So what is freedom? Freedom is seeking out your own limitations, not letting other people tell you what your limitations are. Pushing boundaries, breaking through uh, arbitrary illusions and limitations, okay? Seeking higher ground, seeking new potentials, okay? You're not going to be told what your limitations are. There is some value. There's some joy. There's some meaning in life in seeking out and discovering for yourself what your own limitations are, okay? Um, or you can take the easy way out and you allow yourself to be told. You're, you're given the, the default template that already comes with the limitations and you just buy into it. There is no justification for present existence other than in its, its expansion into an indefinitely open future. So seeking out, basically breaking out of the box, breaking out of arbitrary limitations, uh, seeking out new potentials, new freedoms, okay? Uh, new modes of living. So let me try to give you this example. Maybe some of you have had this experience. I've had this experience where I've had people in positions of authority basically laugh in my face and tell me, no, Mike, you can't do it, okay? You're too stupid or your grades are not high enough or you're, you're in, you, know, you don't have the, the adequate skills. So what, there's two possibilities. One possibility is you allow your identity to be handed back to you by somebody who has therefore limited it for you. They've given back to you a version of yourself which is already constrained. And you can walk out of the office and you might conclude, yeah, the person's right. I am incompetent. I'm not skilled, okay? Uh, I must have been stupid to even have entertained the possibility of doing that. And there's some people that take, they, they, there are some people that don't take no for an answer. The other possibility is this, okay? Somebody basically laughs in your face and they say, oh, you know, you're a woman, you can't run the marathon. And you, you look at the person and you say, fuck you, okay? I'm gonna do it just because I wanna prove you wrong now, okay? Uh, and there's a, that, that's, that's what Simone de Beauvoir is talking about. That, that freedom to break through uh, seemingly arbitrary and non, nonsensical limitations um, and, and, and obstacles, okay? Uh, so that marathon runner, I, I, want, I, I want to run a marathon. I feel like I can run a marathon. I'm told like, I'm told like I can't run a marathon. I'm going to get in trouble for running the marathon. You know what? Let me run the marathon anyways. Let's see what happens. Okay. You are redefining yourself and you're redefining, uh, again, the limits of what it means to be a human being in doing so. So you have to push back. Okay. You have to push back. Uh, you have to resist. You have to rebel a little bit. Uh, there's some sort of meaning in life in doing that. Uh, so it says every time we just basically fall back to the, the given conditions of life and we don't push back on the given conditions. And we just assume that what we are is just the circumstances that we are presently given. She says, we fall into a kind of a stagnation. We stagnate, okay? Uh, and liberty is constrained uh, and becomes con contingent. She says, every individual concerned to justify his existence feels that his existence involves an undefined need to, to transcend oneself, to engage in freely chosen projects, to, to, to resist to push back, to, to want to break through, okay? So I'm being told that I'm limited, but I don't feel like I am. So let's actually find out if I am limited or not. But if I'm gonna find out, I wanna find out for myself. I wanna know firsthand. I'm not gonna to be told by some uh, 
authority, potentially illegitimate authority, that I can do this. Okay. Uh, let me just end with this quote. This is a quote that I really liked from uh, uh, Moonlight that won the Academy Award uh, for Best Film in 2016. And you have uh, Mahershala Ali uh, that in the, the first half of the film, he's kind of like this mentor to this young kid. And he says, uh, at one point, you have to decide for yourself who you're going to be. At one point, you have to decide for yourself who you're going to be. And nobody can make that decision for you. Okay. Now, you can allow other people to, to define you for yourself. You can allow people to give you a, a, an identity uh, that you're going to kind of absorb, but that's also a choice, okay? Being and assimilating to the, to the default pattern, uh, the, the default role that you're expected to play is also a choice, okay? So you have to uh, ultimately, again, and that's kind of what we touched upon with Sartre as well, who you are and how you define yourself as and what is valuable for you and what is valued in you and how you want to be perceived by others is ultimately on you, okay? I, the idea that your identity is your own creative responsibility, okay? So own it. Uh, otherwise, if you don't, again, the tragedy is that you're going to be given a version, uh, a limited version of yourself, which might not be in your best interest. Um, that's it, guys. That's all I have to say. Any questions, comments, reactions to that?